Welcome to another weekly video from our packerguild.com. In this episode we're outside on the farm and we're going to be creating a new fence line. When you want to move alpaca from one location to another, it's really important to think about the type of fences you've got, the angles, perhaps the lay of the land, where you want them to go to, the kind of gates you might have, and create it in such a way that the alpaca are happy to move where you want them to go. That's not the case in this area here. We inherited the yards behind me when we bought this property and they're in the corner of a very large area and it's quite difficult to move them into the yards without some fencing or a group of people to be able to help get behind them. Now we're fortunate with our alpacas that shake a bucket of nuts and they'll probably follow you but that's not the case for every alpaca. So what we're doing here is putting in a new fence line that will create a race. Now once they're in the race there's really only one place for them to go. You can have a single person pushing them from behind and they'll follow their way through. We can even have gates along it so that we can get them to a certain location then lock them in. Races are a fantastic way to move alpaca around or indeed any livestock and this is going to make it extra easy for us to get them in and out of this race more often. And the more we move them into the race the easier it is for us to do maintenance, to check them over, check their body score, look at their nails, give injections and other medications. So this is really important for the alpaca as much as it is for us. So we've got a number one round that we're going to use for this inside post. Of course we already have one in the ground. Now this post, the only force on it, is going to be directly down and into the ground. We're going to have a cross member, that's essentially where it gets its title, the H from. Any tension that's coming from the line down there wants to pull that post over. It's only passing through this one. This doesn't have any sideway tension like that. So it's that post that's going to be taking the strain from the end of the wires. Now by having the post going across the top, as that one wants to lean in the direction of the force, the horizontal we're going to put in is going to stop it doing that. We're going to have a diagonal wire going to the foot of that one that ensures it stays true. And it's that triangle of wood and wire that makes this assembly so incredibly strong. So we've chosen a number one here for a number of reasons. As I say, it's not going to have the sideways strength, but we want to distribute the load as much as we can at the base. There's quite a heavy gate on here, so we're going to want a fair bit of tension on this. And this is also a high pressure zone for the animals. And what I mean by that is, depending on the number of animals that might be up against a fence at any one time and their desire to sort of push through it increases the overall potential for pressure against it. If you've got a large paddock you're probably not going to have a lot of tension up against any one area of the fence unless there's some reason that they want to get through uh, such as there may be other alpaca the other side um, they're generally not going to want to go too close to it. As soon as you create something like a race and you're trying to push the alpaca along it they're going to be looking for different escape paths uh, and in those situations you're going to want to make sure these fences are really strong. So good strong vertical at this point and of course we already have an incredibly strong one at that end and we'll be doing the same sort of assembly at the other so no doubt about it this will be a very good fence. One thing that I have chosen to do though is to put an extra long horizontal across here. Now the length is important. The greater the length the less downward force we're going to have on this. There's all sorts of formulas relating to Pythagoras theorem and what have you that basically calculate all of this but the general rule of thumb is if you get the longer um, posts between these, the longer horizontal, then you're going to be able to create a stronger assembly at this end. And of course we have to match it at the other end uh, for this to, be, this to be viable. So a 2.1 meter number one round and we're going to get it as far into the ground as we can. Well, this post isn't as, as thick and it doesn't need to be. It's the horizontal one, it's not going to go into the ground. And this one's 2.4 metres. Now that is quite long for the top of an H. Um, what's important about these is they're all treated. And when they go into the ground obviously they, they're going to spend some time with water around them. Uh, we refer to these as H4 treated. The type of treatment you might get will obviously depend on the territory that you're in. But what we want to do is to not cut into these ideally. Treatment, uh, certainly of these timbers, is only on the surface. It's pressure treated, it's been pushed in under pressure. If we start to cut into these, we'll get to untreated wood and it'll deteriorate over time. 
So when we build this assembly, rather than just putting in the verticals and then cutting this down based on the distance between them, we're going to ensure that that distance is exactly right to fit this horizontal post along the top. So what we need to do next is to measure out 2.4 meters center to center from this post so that we can get the next one in. And critically important, of course, is that we have our line absolutely straight too. So we'll get those things organized, find the spot on the ground, and let's start digging. So 2.4 for the top, plus we need to go another 110 because of the diameter of the second post. That's gonna be our center. An auger is a really easy way to dig these sort of holes. You're gonna get a nice straight hole going as deep as you're able to get to with the auger. You know that it's going to be vertical because you can easily work with the spirit level and just keep checking on it. And it's an awful lot less work, especially if you've got clay, which I have here. A little bit of topsoil, but below that it's rather unpleasant. Of course, if you've got rocks, that can be a little bit harder as well. Augers quite often only go in one direction. So you need to be able to stop the auger and pull it out if you're gonna hit things like roots or rocks. So just be mindful of the type of auger that you're gonna use. Now, this one just sits on the back of my John Deere one family machine, a 1025R. Uh, it's 25 horsepower. You know, it's, it's a half decent machine, but it's certainly at the, the baby tractor end for John Deere and, and other manufacturers. But it's perfectly powerful enough for this. In fact, I run it on the, uh, the lowest revs when it's turning, no need to go fast. Um, you can, of course, also hire auger machines that are just augers, typically. One of the key things to be mindful of is the diameter. This is a 300 millimeter wide auger. Now, that's quite a bit larger, of course, than the post that's going to go in. That's only 110. Uh, but what we need to do is to be able to ram the soil around it once it goes in. So the auger has to be quite a bit wider than the post to give us room to be able to do that. The other thing to consider is because of the angle of this, the, the arc of the bar that's actually holding the auger from the back of the machine, as we start to drill the hole, it will actually start to sort of come out and then back in. We also need to be mindful of the slope of the ground. If we want this to be vertical, we need to position the machine, whether it's a tractor with one on the back as we've got here or a dedicated auger machine, so that we're dead vertical to the ground in this situation. If you're building your fence assembly on a slope, then you might want to have the posts leaning into that slope. But in this environment here, we're just gonna be putting it dead vertical into the ground, or as close to vertical as I can get it anyway. All right, start up the machine. Before we do, safety first. This thing is able to dig through incredibly hard soil. It's not gonna stall or stop or even notice if you get caught up in it. Just keep away from this end. This is uh, very unpleasant once it's moving. So that's 700 mil down, really in just a few minutes. So uh, yeah, the auger's done a great job for us here. Let's move everything away and we'll get the pole in. Okay, uh, whoops, <laughs> a bit lively. Right, that's our post going in. One end is normally a little bit thicker than the other. I've put the larger end at the bottom because the bigger the foot, the more it's gonna spread that load out. Remember, this is the one that's gonna be pushing down into the ground. And in fact, if you're concerned about it sinking, you can put some hardcore, some rocks, some bricks, something in the bottom that will just distribute that load even further. In this area, it's actually free flowing. There's no moisture down at the bottom there. This thing's gonna stay where it gets put. Uh, so I'm quite comfortable with it, but that's certainly something you can do if you want a little bit of extra strength. So we've got our spirit level, but before I do any more, I'm gonna measure across here, make sure I've got this hole in the right place. Inside to inside, 2.4, exactly what we wanted it to be. That's perfect. We'll keep measuring that as we round the soil in, and we'll keep checking that it's vertical in all directions as well. Uh, the rammer can easily start to move things around. Now, of course, we cut this grass earlier. That's not just for aesthetics. At this point, when we're trying to shift all this soil around, it's a lot easier when it's not all matted in with long grass. So, yeah, learned that from uh, past experience. Always cut the grass before you dig your hole. Okay, make sure that you're ramming the soil in layer at a time. Don't just fill it and then ram at the top. You wanna to be ramming it in regularly and then just putting the soil in as you go. Really work it in all the way round. Make sure that soil is nice and compacted. Now on this post, of course, all our force is going straight down. For the other post, it's going to be sideways. So it's less important perhaps for this one, but it's good practice to get into to make sure that the 
soil is very well compacted when you're putting the post in. So the post is in the ground, that's exactly where we need it to be, at least I think it is. We need to measure now, make sure that this is exactly the 2.4 meters that we thought it was going to be. Now, if you've got a second pair of hands, this certainly makes it a lot easier, one at each end, but uh, if you're doing it on your own or your second pair of hands is running the camera, then a great idea is to put a G-clamp here. Put it horizontally, it just creates a really nice firm surface that you can rest something on while you're working at the other end. It's not as good as someone holding it, so still be careful, you don't want it falling off. Even these uh, thinner posts are pretty heavy if they're uh, going to fall on your toe, but at least uh, we've got something to hold at that end while we're measuring it. Proof is in the pudding, let's see what this works, works out to be. Absolutely spot on. Doesn't always happen that way. Okay, great. Well, it's not gonna stay there itself, and we can't leave the G-clamp on there. So the next thing we need to do is to actually secure this in place. Now to do that, we're going to be putting a screw into each end. Given that this is impregnated in order to give it the treatment, I really don't want to be cutting into this. I don't wanna be putting any kind of ledge at each end. I don't want any sort of cut into the wood as, that, that's needed. So what we're going to do is be putting a bolt through. Choosing the right type of bolt is essential. I'll put this down for now. So I've got an exceptionally good screw here. It's very strong. Uh, it's not susceptible corrosion from any of the chemicals that might be in the wood. It's ideally suited for outside. In fact, it's, uh, I think it's called a landscaping screw. It doesn't need drilling. Uh, it's, um, it's got its own drill bit on the end, priced accordingly. But hey, you don't need too many of these, one at each end. If we look at the length of it, and bearing in mind this top is going to be under such incredible pressure that uh, the grip of the wood is really going to keep it where it is. This is just to stop it sagging, make sure it stays in one place, so we don't need a lot of screw going into the wood, but we're going to use about half of this. Now we don't really want one the whole width of the wood here, so what we're going to do is use a spade bit. That's going to cut halfway into the wood, an extension bit so that we can get our screw onto the end. And our spade bit here is wide enough to allow this extension to go through. So we'll start from the outside, drill halfway in using our spade bit, use our extension, get through the other side. And as soon as we start to see it peeking out here, we're gonna offer up the pole and drill it the rest of the way in. Plenty of room for our screw and the extension here. I want the screw to be horizontal, so just make sure that I can get to the end. Obviously there's a bit of play this end, but that's fine. We can control that as we go in. Just poking out the other end, so we'll be able to join that up easy enough. Let's go and do the same to the other post now, and then we can get these screws all the way through. So I've measured this with a spirit level. We know that it's perfect. We've put the screw in the other end. We'll just finish tightening this one up. Absolutely spot on where I needed. Now that's not going to go anywhere. Once we get some tension on it, it's going to be absolutely rock solid. So when this gate is closed and locked, we've got a pin that actually takes the strain of it here. But when it's open like this, this incredibly heavy gate is going to want this post here to lean forward as we discussed earlier. Now, it's fine that we're creating a lot of strength here, or will do when we put the diagonal wire in. But what would be really helpful, rather than just transferring all of that weight across, which eventually goes down into here, is to put a foot down here. And that's what we're going to do now. It doesn't need to be at the bottom. In fact, I might even put it up here somewhere. It's a really easy thing to do. Just take a little bit of this weight off of the, uh, off of the gate. With a bit of scrap 4x2, pre-drilled, going to put a couple of these really strong bugle screws in, and they'll just hold this in place. Now all this is going to do is when the gate is open, it just gives us a little bit of extra distribution of weight downwards from this. And already our H is starting to add some value for this gate. And then the next thing we're going to install is these coach screws. 10 mil, we're going to use a 10 mil ratchet. And what these will do is they'll allow us to really hold the wire in place, giving plenty of strength. The wire is essentially going to go over the top of this so it'll be quite a tight bend around it, but that'll stop it slipping down the wood. 
there's no way we could use a regular nail or staple because of the strains that are going to be on this. We're going to be using two and a half mil high tensile wire, so we've got to have the appropriate tools to hold it in place. Okay, final stage now is to get this wire on. I'm using a bit of wire that we took off a, another fence. You'll see in some of our other videos that we really like to use Waratahs. It's a great way of putting up fences, taking them down. They can be quite temporary or long term. As a result, when you move things around, you also get plenty of wire left over from other fences. So it's great from an environmental impact perspective because of course you get plenty of wire for your next project. So all I'm gonna do here now is to run this diagonally across these two points, going over the coach bolt that we put here and under the coach bolt here, bring them together in the center, and then we'll get some tension put on them. Okay, so we've made sure that uh, the wire is above the bolt here, below the bolt there. I've gone around twice to give it some extra strength. It's probably not necessary, but had plenty of wire. And I want this to last. Oh, we're getting a lot of tension on this now. Of course, these wires are finding their way around those two bolts that we put in. They're getting nice and tight there, it's getting shaped around the wood. The wood itself is actually going to be quite, uh, be, be giving quite a bit of resistance against the wire. Um, but you can still get these pretty tight. I mean, I'll probably get a couple more clicks in, but I think we're, we're almost there. And one for luck. Whew. That's pretty tight now, that'll certainly do. And there we have it. A fence assembly built, an H style fence assembly. I suppose it's more of a lowercase h really. Uh, so we've gone for a 2.4 at the top, giving us that extra lean out. Um, and with doubling up the wire here, or we could have used thicker wire if we had some. Got plenty of strength, so all of this force now is going straight down into here. Now we've actually put quite a bit of tension on here, I mean a lot of tension. So if anything, this is going to want to start to go the other way. But that's not a spring. So as it starts to come across, it's not like that pressure is going to be continuous. It gets to a point where it settles down. And in fact for that reason you may want to adjust this from time to time. Maybe come back every six months and just see if it needs tightening. They, they do loosen up over time. With this done now, we're ready to start putting our fence line in and this will take a lot of strain. So we'll get a similar assembly up to the other end and we'll build our, build our fence line. We'll make that part two of this. For now, that's an H, built and finished. Thank you very much for watching. And if you've enjoyed this as much as I have, and I've put a fair bit into this, Perhaps you wouldn't mind uh, liking and subscribing. It does make an awful lot of difference to the channel. Thank you very much and goodbye.